Well, the only woman on Oklahoma's death row one step closer to execution. The Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals has upheld Brenda Andrews' murder conviction and death sentence. In 2004, you may remember, the former Sunday school teacher was convicted of the first-degree murder of her husband. There was a myth that if you survived an execution, you were off the hook. But nope, that's just a bedtime story. In reality, when the judge says, until dead, they mean it. You're in for the long haul, no refunds or second chances. Back in the day, though, surviving your own execution was like winning a morbid lottery. It was a sign from the universe that you might have dodged a bullet. Some legends stared death in the face and said, not today, Grim Reaper. In this video, we'll take a stroll down the gallows of history and meet some women who defied the odds. Half hang at Maggie. In order to understand the incredible story of Half Hang at Maggie, we must start at the beginning with the woman herself. Margaret Dixon, affectionately known as Maggie, was born in Musselburg, a small town located just five miles from Edinburgh around the year 1702. Musselburg, with its thriving economy and bustling fishing industry, provided the backdrop for Maggie's early life. Maggie's life took a turn when she married a man named Patrick Spence, who was a fisherman by trade. The couple lived together in Musselburg until tragedy struck in 1723. Patrick mysteriously disappeared, leaving Maggie alone and in need of a way to support herself. The circumstances surrounding Patrick's disappearance remain shrouded in mystery, with some speculating that he was press-ganged into the Royal Navy, while others believe he was lured onto a fishing fleet and never seen again. Regardless of the truth, Maggie found herself abandoned and forced to find a means of survival. No longer able to rely on her husband's income, she took to the streets of Edinburgh, selling salt to make ends meet. It was during this time that she crossed paths with the landlord's son at an inn where she found work. The two grew closer, and within a year, Maggie gave birth to a baby boy. However, tragedy struck once again as the child either died shortly after birth or was stillborn. Fearing the consequences of revealing the birth and potentially losing her position at the inn, Maggie made the fateful decision to conceal the infant's death. She carefully wrapped the lifeless body and placed it on the banks of the River Tweed, hoping to hide the evidence of her secret. Days later, the body was discovered downstream at Maxwell Hugh, and all signs pointed to Maggie as the one who had concealed the birth. Swiftly arrested, she was taken back to Edinburgh to await trial. Maggie, dressed in her simple attire, stood before the court, her fate hanging in the balance. The trial, which took place in Edinburgh, focused on the charge of concealing the birth of her infant son. An inquest was conducted on the child's body to determine whether he had been born alive. The surgeon involved in the examination performed the usual tests, including placing the child's lungs in water to see if they would float, indicating that the child had taken a breath. The surgeon's testimony played a crucial role in the jury's decision. They believed that the child had indeed been born alive as the lungs floated when placed in water. Despite the unreliable nature of this test, it was enough to sway the jury against Maggie. Despite Maggie's protests of innocence, the jury found her guilty, and on August 6, 1724, she was sentenced to death. The date of her execution was set for September 2nd, and the gallows in Edinburgh's grass market would become the site of one of the most remarkable events in Scottish history. As the day of her execution drew near, Maggie faced the grim reality of her impending fate. She spent her final days in either Edinburgh jail or the toll booth, awaiting the moment when she would face the hangman's noose. The weight of her impending death hung heavy on her shoulders, but she remained resolute, determined to face her fate with courage. On September 2nd, 1724, the day of her execution, Maggie was led to the gallows in Edinburgh's grass market. The crowd gathered, their eyes fixed on the woman who had become the subject of much speculation and intrigue. As she stood on a ladder with the noose around her neck, a hush fell over the crowd. It was at this moment that a conversation between Maggie and the hangman, Jock Dalgleish, is said to have taken place. Legend has it that Jock tied the noose just loosely enough for Maggie to slip her fingers through, preventing it from tightening around her throat. Whether this conversation occurred in Maggie's cell before her execution or at the top of the ladder remains a matter of debate, but the fact remains that Maggie's life was spared, at least momentarily. With a quick shove, the hangman pushed Maggie off the ladder, and for a brief moment, it seemed as though she had met her end. But fate had other plans. A scuffle broke out among the crowd as medical students, friends, and family rushed to claim Maggie's body. In the chaos, her friends managed to rescue her, hiding her in a wooden coffin and placing her on a bier to transport her back to Musselburgh for burial. The cart carrying Maggie's coffin made its way through the streets. An unexpected turn of events occurred. The jostling of the cart, combined with the resilience of Maggie's spirit, brought her back to life. Inside the coffin, Maggie regained consciousness, her body shaken but alive. A local surgeon examined Maggie and confirmed her miraculous recovery. 
She had cheated death, and in less than an hour, she was allowed to walk back home to Musselburg, a woman reborn. After her miraculous escape from the gallows, Maggie returned to her hometown of Musselburg, where she was greeted with both awe and disbelief. The news of her survival spread, capturing the imagination of the townspeople and beyond. Maggie had become a living legend, a woman who had defied death itself. Upon her return, Maggie's husband, the very man who had deserted her and set in motion the chain of events that led to her trial, reappeared in her life. The details of their reunion remain shrouded in mystery, but it is said that they reconciled and rekindled their love. Together, they embarked on a new chapter, determined to make the most of the second chance they had been given. Maggie's experience as an in worker had not deterred her from the hospitality industry. In fact, she embraced her newfound notoriety. She became an ale housekeeper, running her own establishment in a town of her choosing. As the years passed, Maggie's story continued to captivate the hearts and minds of those who heard it. Her tale of survival against all odds became a source of inspiration and hope. People marveled at her resilience and the strength she displayed in the face of adversity. Her name became synonymous with courage and the indomitable human spirit. Maggie's legacy extended beyond her own lifetime. Today, her story story lives on in the annals of history and the bricks and mortar of Edinburgh's grass market. The Maggie Dixon pub, located opposite the site where she nearly met her end, proudly displays a plaque recounting her remarkable tale. In addition to the physical reminders of her story, Maggie's legend has also found a home in the digital age. Her story has become an internet sensation, captivating audiences around the world. Tour guides in Edinburgh regale visitors with the tale of half hang at Maggie, ensuring that her story continues to be passed down through the generations. Anne Green. This story is set in a small kitchen nestled within the grand estate of Sir Thomas Reed, a prominent justice of the peace in the 17th century. It is here that we find Anne Green, a scullery maid in her early adulthood, toiling away in the service of the Reed family. It was in the shadows of the estate that Anne's path crossed with that of Geoffrey Reed, Sir Thomas's grandson. Anne, a young and impressionable woman, found herself drawn to Geoffrey's charm and youthful energy, and so, a forbidden romance began to blossom between them. Time passed, and Anne soon discovered that she was with a child. Shocked and frightened, she grappled with the reality of her situation. Unaware of her pregnancy until that moment, Anne's world was turned upside down. She knew that her secret could not remain hidden forever. Tragically, Anne's pregnancy took a devastating turn. After 17 weeks, she suffered a miscarriage in the privacy of the estate's privy. Overwhelmed by grief and desperation, Anne tried to conceal the remains of the fetus, hoping to protect herself from the consequences of her situation. But fate had other plans. Anne's secret was soon discovered, and she was accused of infanticide. Sir Thomas, driven by the prevailing laws of the time, prosecuted Anne under the Concealment of Birth of Bastards Act. This act presumed that any woman who concealed the death of her illegitimate child was guilty of murder. The trial that followed was a harrowing affair. A midwife testified that the fetus was too underdeveloped to have ever been alive, suggesting that Anne was innocent of the charges. However, several servants who had worked closely with Anne testified that she had experienced issues for approximately a month before her miscarriage. Their testimonies painted a damning picture. Despite the conflicting testimonies, the court found Anne guilty guilty of murder. In December 1650, Anne was led to Oxford Castle, where she would face the ultimate punishment for her alleged crime. The noose was placed around her neck, and the crowd watched in anticipation as justice was about to be served. But Anne had one final request. In a shocking twist, she asked her friends to pull her swinging body and a soldier to strike her with the butt of his musket, hoping to expedite her death. The crowd held their breath as the soldier delivered the blows, believing that Anne's life was slipping away. After what seemed like an eternity, everyone believed Anne to be dead. Her lifeless body was cut down and handed over to the University of Oxford physicians William Petty and Thomas Willis for dissection. Little did they know that their world was about to be turned upside down, and so the stage is set for an incredible turn of events. After Anne's lifeless body was handed over to the University of Oxford physicians William Petty and Thomas Willis, they began their examination, but to their astonishment, they discovered that Anne still had a faint pulse and was weakly breathing. It was a moment that would change the course of history, realizing the gravity of the situation situation, Petty and Willis sought the assistance of their esteemed colleagues, Ralph Bathurst and Henry Clerk. Together, this group of physicians embarked on a desperate mission to revive Anne, determined to unravel the mystery behind her miraculous survival. The physicians spared no effort in their quest to bring Anne back to life. They poured hot cordial down her throat, hoping to revive her weakened body. They rubbed her limbs and extremities vigorously, attempting to stimulate her circulation. Bloodletting was performed, and a poultice was applied to her breasts. They even administered a tobacco smoke enema.
enema, a treatment believed to have therapeutic properties. As the physicians exhausted every possible remedy, they made a crucial decision. They placed Anne in a warm bed alongside another woman who would provide constant care and warmth. It was a last-ditch effort to revive her fading spirit and bring her back from the brink of death. Miraculously, Anne's condition began to improve. After 12 to 14 hours of intensive treatment, she started to regain consciousness. Weekly at first, she began to speak. The physicians and caretakers watched in awe as Anne defied all odds and fought her way back to life. Within four days, Anne's strength returned and she was able to eat solid food. Her body, once on the brink of death, now thrived on sustenance. It was a remarkable transformation that left the physicians and those around her in awe of her tenacity and will to survive. However, as Anne regained her physical strength, she faced a new challenge. She suffered from amnesia, unable to recall the events surrounding her execution. The memories of her trial, the noose around her neck, and the soldier's blows were lost to her. It was a blank space in her mind. News of Anne's miraculous recovery spread like wildfire, reaching the ears of the authorities. In light of this extraordinary turn of events, they granted her a reprieve from execution. The hand of God, they believed, had intervened to save her, demonstrating her innocence in the eyes of the law. Furthermore, one pamphleteer noted that Sir Thomas Reed, the prosecutor in Anne's trial, died just three days after her hanging. With no one to object, the authorities ultimately decided to pardon Anne. It was a moment of redemption, a recognition that she had been unjustly condemned. However, not everyone was pleased with Anne's newfound freedom. Some of her enemies, filled with wrath and anger, sought to overturn the pardon. They even proposed that she be carried back to the place of execution and hanged once again, defying all notions of law, reason, and justice. In a surprising twist, a group of honest soldiers present at the time intervened on Anne's behalf. They expressed their discontent with the proposed injustice, preventing any further harm from befalling her. It was a moment of compassion and humanity amidst the chaos that surrounded Anne's life. After her recovery, Anne chose to leave the city and seek solace with friends in the countryside. She took with her the very coffin that was meant to be her final resting place, a constant reminder of the incredible journey she had undertaken. In time, Anne married and had three children, embracing a new chapter in her life. The accounts of Anne's later life vary. Robert Plotz, The Natural History of Oxfordshire, claims that she passed away in 1659, while William Petty asserted that she lived for 15 years after her hanging, dying around 1665. The exact details may remain a mystery, but the impact of Anne's story continues to resonate through the ages. Susanna Brown Susanna, just two weeks shy of her 16th birthday, found herself caught in the clutches of the Nazi regime. Alongside her sister AGI and their parents, she was forcibly taken from their hometown of Kosice in what is now Slovakia and transported to the dreaded Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. As the family arrived at the camp, they were immediately separated. Susanna's father, in a heart-wrenching moment, shouted his last words to her. Take care of your sister! AGI, already in fragile health, became Susanna's sole focus, her reason to defy death. Susanna vividly recalls the chilling details of their time in Auschwitz-Birkenau. The women were stripped of their clothes and herded into what appeared to be showers. The air carried a faint odor of gas and fear gripped their hearts. Behind a steel door clutching bars of soap, the women anxiously awaited water. Some had heard rumors of the gas chambers, and panic began to set in. But in a twist of fate, when the doors finally opened, they realized they had narrowly escaped death. The gas had run out. Wearing dresses taken from gypsies who had met their tragic fate before them, Susanna and AGI were loaded onto trucks and transported to Estonia. There, they joined thousands of other women on a grueling death march, a sinister plan by the Nazis to exterminate or weaken as many prisoners as possible. The sisters faced unimaginable challenges during this march, but their bond and Susanna's determination to protect AGI propelled them forward. At one point, they encountered a wide river, a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. AGI, unable to to swim faced certain death. But Susanna, resourceful and quick-thinking, fashioned makeshift wooden floats to carry her sister to safety. Their survival continued, but the journey was far from over. They were eventually taken to the Stuffhof camp in Poland, where AGI was placed in the infirmary due to her deteriorating health. Under the cover of darkness, Susanna would sneak in food to sustain her sister, risking her own life for Aji's well-being. As the Nazis realized that Russian forces were closing in on the camp, they resorted to desperate measures. Lethal injections containing strychnine and gasoline were administered to as many inmates as possible. In a moment of sheer bravery, Susanna instructed her sister and three other women to turn their arms over, hoping to avoid a direct injection into a vein. The poison took effect swiftly, causing Susanna's hand to go numb, leaving behind a pale, rounded scar as a haunting reminder. But Susanna's determination knew no bounds. With a handful of hay, she applied pressure to her arm, causing the poison to erupt like a geyser. She then used the stalks of hay to dig into her flesh, desperately attempting to remove the deadly substance. Miraculously, 
she managed to do the same for her sister and another woman. Covered in blood, she dragged her sister to a nearby hill and rolled her down it, playing dead as a Nazi officer passed by. Aji's life depended on Susanna's every move. Finally, Susanna found an abandoned cow shed where she nourished her sister with leftover milk until the arrival of Russian forces the next day. Journey to survival had taken them through the depths of despair, but their bond remained unbroken. After enduring the horrors of the Holocaust, Susanna and Aji's journey to survival continued long after the war had ended. They faced new challenges, but their resilience and love for one another carried them through. Susanna, now free from the clutches of the Nazi regime, found herself in a world forever changed. Determined to build a new life, she embarked on a path of healing and hope. In time, she met her soulmate, married, and gave birth to a daughter. The scars of the past remained, but Susanna's spirit remained unbroken. AGI, however, faced ongoing medical challenges resulting from the atrocities she had endured. Her feet had become gangrene during the war, and it seemed that her suffering would never cease. Medical staff in Danzig recognized Agi's dire condition and made the difficult decision to amputate her gangrened feet. It was a life-saving procedure, one that offered AGI a chance at a future she had once thought impossible. Throughout their journey, Susanna believed that divine providence had guided their steps. It was not just her own determination, but a higher power working alongside her. She often referred to it as her sixth sense, a force that had protected and guided her through the darkest of times. Eventually, Susanna and AGI made the life-changing decision to immigrate to Israel. It was a place where they could leave behind the shadows of their past and embrace a future filled with promise. In Israel, Susanna's love for her sister remained unwavering. AGI, though she never had children of her own, found solace in the warmth and support of her extended family. Together, they forged a new chapter, cherishing the gift of life that had been granted to them. Today, Susanna is a proud mother and grandmother, and her family is a testament to the resilience and strength that runs through her veins. AGI, though she passed away in 2013 at the age of 88, lives on in the hearts and memories of those who knew her. It was Aji's passing that prompted Susanna to share their remarkable story with the world. Returning to their hometown alongside filmmaker Yarden Carmen, she embarked on a mission to document their experiences, ensuring that Aji's memory would be preserved for generations to come. Others. Iran is a country known for its strict adherence to traditional values and laws. It is in this system that Zuleika Kadkota found herself at the center of a scandal that would forever change her life. Charged with the crime of adultery, a crime punishable by death, Zuleika's fate seemed sealed. The sentence handed down to her was one of the most brutal and barbaric forms of execution known to mankind, stoning. Buried up to her waist in the ground, Zuleika awaited her impending doom. The villagers gathered around, ready to carry out the punishment. Stones were picked up, and the air was filled with tension and anticipation. As the first stone was thrown, a sharp disapproving reaction rippled through the crowd. Some questioned the morality of such a punishment, while others were simply horrified by the brutality of it all. Despite the outcry, the stoning continued. Stone after stone rained down upon Zuleika's body, inflicting unimaginable pain and suffering. The villagers believed that by the time the stoning ceased, Zuleika would be dead. Her lifeless body was taken to the morgue, where it was expected to be prepared for burial. But fate had a different plan in store for Zuleika. As the morgue attendants began their somber task, they made a shocking discovery. Zuleika was not dead. Incredibly, she was still breathing. The news spread and soon, Zuleika was rushed to the hospital, where doctors fought to save her life. Zuleika's survival was nothing short of a miracle. The stoning, meant to be the end of her life, had failed to claim her. Zuleika Kadkota's survival sparked a fierce debate within her community. It sheds light on the harsh realities faced by women in societies where archaic laws and traditions still hold sway. There was also a similar situation in Raqqa when it was under the control of the notorious terrorist organization ISIS. An unnamed woman found herself accused of adultery, a crime that, according to the twisted ideology of ISIS, warranted death by stoning. On a fateful day in January 2015, the woman was led to Alfredo Street, where the brutal execution was to take place. The atmosphere was tense as the members of ISIS gathered around, ready to carry out their brutal acts. The woman stood, bound and helpless, as the crowd prepared to unleash a torrent of stones upon her. The stoning began, and the woman endured the unimaginable pain and suffering inflicted upon her. Stone after stone struck her body as onlookers watched in horror. The ISIS members believed that by the time the stoning ceased, the woman would be dead. Her life, 
snuffed out by their twisted interpretation of justice, but fate had other plans. As the stones rained down upon her, the woman stirred. Despite the agony she endured, she summoned the strength to rise to her feet. In a moment of sheer determination, she began to flee, desperate to escape the clutches of her tormentors. One of the ISIS members, fueled by rage and a desire to ensure her demise, aimed his weapon at the fleeing woman. But just as he prepared to pull the trigger, a Sharia judge intervened. He recognized that the woman had endured her sentence and he declared, her sentence is done, let her go, and repent to her God. At that moment, the woman's life was spared. She had defied death, escaped the clutches of Isis, and was granted a second chance at life. Let's look at other women that defied the odds. The year 1264 was a period marked by harsh laws and unforgiving punishments. Inetta de Balsham, also known as Judith de Balsham, found herself at the center of a grave accusation, harboring thieves. For this crime, she was sentenced to death by hanging. On a somber Monday morning in August, the gallows stood tall, ready to claim Inetta's life. As the hour struck 9 a.m., the noose was placed around her neck, and she was left suspended, her life hanging by a thread. The crowd watched, expecting her life to be extinguished before their eyes. Hours turned into an agonizing day as Inetta remained hanging, defying the expectations of those who witnessed her plight. The sunset and darkness enveloped the scene, but still, she clung to life. Sunrise brought a glimmer of hope as the first rays of light illuminated the gallows, revealing Inetta's astonishing survival. How had she managed to survive such a brutal punishment. The answer lay in a peculiar condition known as ossification. Inetta's windpipe had undergone a remarkable transformation. Bony tissue had formed, ossifying her airway and preventing it from being compressed in the manner necessary to end her life. This extraordinary occurrence, though rare, had been documented before. In fact, a similar case involving a Swiss man who survived multiple hanging attempts due to ossification in his neck had been recorded. Inetta de Balsham's survival defied the laws of nature and left many in awe. There was another like her. In 16 1992, Elizabeth Proctor, a respected member of the community, found herself caught in the grip of a witchcraft frenzy. Despite the testimony of her friends and neighbors, she was accused and sentenced to death. Elizabeth's pregnancy added another layer of complexity to her dire situation. As the day of her execution arrived, she carried within her the life of an innocent child. The noose was placed around her neck, and the hatch of the scaffold was opened, ready to claim her life. But fate intervened in the most unexpected way. As Elizabeth fell into the hatch, instead of meeting her demise, she miraculously survived the fall. The crowd gasped in disbelief, unsure of what they were witnessing. Elizabeth, though battered and bruised, clung to life. The authorities, faced with this unforeseen turn of events, were unsure of how to proceed. Elizabeth's survival challenged the very foundation of the accusations against her. The question of her guilt or innocence became even more complex in the face of this miraculous escape from death. Elizabeth's survival ignited a fierce debate among the townspeople. Some saw it as a sign of her innocence, a divine intervention protecting an innocent life. Life. Others, however, remained steadfast in their belief in her guilt, viewing her survival as evidence of her alleged pact with the devil. Despite the controversy, Elizabeth's life was spared. She was granted a reprieve from the gallows, but her ordeal was far from over. The scars, both physical and emotional, would forever mark her as a survivor of a dark chapter in history. If you enjoyed this video, click on the card showing on your screen right now for more videos.